Hello and welcome to Genre Chat. Our topic this week is biographies. And our guest author, most of you will know him if you saw him. He's a best-selling author of over 185 books. Most of you know him from his Left Behind series, but we chose him to talk about biographies because he has written many. I want to introduce to you Jerry Jenkins. Welcome, Jerry. Tell us a little bit about your writing career if we don't already know. Well, thanks so much for having me. And, and uh, you're right. A lot of people don't know that I write biographies as well. In fact, my first 17 or 18 books, so right, right around 10% of my total, uh, were nonfiction books. And, um, you know, a lot of those were, were biographies. Most of these are first person as told to autobiographies. So I'm really writing someone else's story in their words. And as I say, in the first person, but from their standpoint. So uh, I did one of the first early breaks in my career. I was just uh, in my early 20s, uh, and I had been a sports writer. I came into uh, Christian publishing from, from sports writing, and I was editor of a Sunday school paper and that type of thing. But my boss was a great editor, and he you know, always edited me very ferociously and aggressively. I learned a lot from that. But one day he came in my office, and he said, uh, he said I've been asked to write an inspirational book on Hank Aaron. And I, I was the ultimate baseball fan. Hank Aaron was one of my heroes. And um, so this guy says, uh, um, you know, I, he said, maybe you want to help me write it because, uh, or he says, maybe you want to write it because um, you know football and I don't. And I, <laughs> I said, uh, <laughs> apparently you don't if you think Hank Aaron's a football player. But he said he'd been asked to, to write an inspirational book because Aaron apparently in the late 50s, his wife had tw uh, twins at a hospital in Milwaukee, and they lost one of the, the babies. And, uh, but they were in a Catholic hospital, and one of the priests there befriended them, and, and uh, so they converted to Catholicism and became fairly devout. And so my boss said, uh, when, he, when, when I told him uh, how huge Hank Aaron was and what it was all about, um, he said, well, you help me write it then. I'll write the inspirational part, and you write the, the baseball part. Um, and that, that led to, I don't know how much time we have, but that led to a funny story, if I could share. We have, quite, we have 30 minutes, so people, we want to hear more about that kind of stuff. What else, who else did you write biographies about? Well, um, that opened the door to just about any sports biography I wanted to write because I was able to sit, you know, list that as one of my books. It was my fourth book. I'd written some Christian education books and that type of thing, and, and another biography of a, an evangelist. My very first uh, story was about a, a, I was 23 and this guy was 25, but he was worth a life story already. He was one of these sold out guys that just shared his faith everywhere he went. And, you know, we're friends to this day. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been a lot of years. I mean, that was 1974. Um, we're both grandfathers by now. I still serve on his board. He, he ministers around the world. And, and uh, I just finished updating that very book. It's called Unashamed, a, a Memoir of Dangerous Faith. And uh, so we'll, we're, we're trying to place that right now. But uh, I did books on um, Walter Payton, uh, the, the football great who died too soon, but was a, a superstar. Um, I did uh, Oral Hershiser, the Dodger pitcher back in the 80s. Uh, Nolan Ryan, the great pitcher for the Texas Rangers. Um, so lots of, of people books like that. A lot, of, And I did a lot of musicians. I did B.J. Thomas. I did Christine Wurtzen. Um, I did a, an Olympi, Olympic uh, track star, and so I got to go to the Olympics in 76, the Bruce Jenner year and, and uh, all that stuff. Um, so it's really taken me quite a, quite a ways. But the, the highlight of my career, I think, as far as uh, working on someone's memoirs or, or biography, I was asked to assist Billy Graham with his memoir. Mm -hmm. just as I am. Now, that was a ghost job. My name's not on the cover. It is in the acknowledgments, and my mother know, knew what page it was on, so she would carry it around and show people <laughs> Uh, that was really, that really was the privilege of a lifetime. Wow. Now, if you could write anybody's biography right now, sports person, who would that be? You know, um, I'd love to do one on this new, uh, he's not new anymore. He's been in the league already 10 years, but this, this guy that pitches for the, the Los Angeles Dodgers, Clayton Kershaw, um, he's one of the best pitchers ever already. And he's had three Cy Young awards. People who know, know baseball know what that means. Um, but he's an outstanding believer and, and a quite an advocate for his faith. He and his wife have ministries in Africa. They build churches and, and things like that. And he's quite, he's quite wealthy. Um, baseball has changed over the years. 
Um, I remember when I did Nolan Ryan's book, he said he had to drive a gas truck in the off season when he started out to make ends meet. That wasn't true by the end of his career, but Clayton Kershaw, he starts uh, about every fourth or fifth game for the, for the Dodgers. So about 33 games a year he pitches and his salary is $33 million. I'd pitch for half that, but uh, <laughs> um, that's, that's pretty good stuff. But he, as I say, very generous and very outspoken. And uh, that, you know, I, I don't know if I would ever be able to, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make a contact there and see if he'd be interested in having somebody do his biography who understands his faith. That's a crucial thing, I think, for, for these guys. Yeah, I think so, too. Well, I'll pray about that for you, Jerry, because that would be great. Um, is there any biography that you would like to do of non-sports person? Well, there are a lot of interesting people uh, out there, and um, I guess I haven't thought of that because I've been so immersed in, in fiction, and mm -hmm. I, I keep thinking if I did a, a biography, it'd probably be, be sports and probably somebody like Kershaw, but I'd have to think about that. Um, um, you know, there, there are some fascinating people in the political world yes. that are so controversial that it's hard to, it's hard to know whether it would, it would make sense to do it. Um, but I'm, I'm always open for, for interesting projects. I know you're a person of truth, too. So we know why you chose this genre. It was kind of handed to you. What is the greatest lesson you've learned while writing biographies? Um, overall life lesson, a lesson in writing itself? Yeah, uh, I've really learned on, on both points there. Um, as far as in writing autobiographies, I went from uh, writing in the first person as told to from the standpoint of how it would read if I were that, um, you know, if I were the star. So it sounded like me at first. Yeah, that must have been hard to it, grab their voice. Yeah, it really was. And, and somehow, and I'm not sure why, maybe it was just because he had such an engaging voice, but... When I did Oral Hershiser, he'd had this incredible year for the Dodgers in 88, won the most valuable player of the series, won the Cy Young Award, was, you know, the athlete of the year for sporting news and all that stuff. But again, a guy very outspoken about his faith. In fact, the, mm -hmm. the camera caught him in the dugout and he was singing. And they said, what were you singing? In fact, he was on the, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson at the time. And he said, I was singing the, the doxology. And people started clapping, and he said, oh, well, I'm not going to sing. I'm not a singer. And Johnny said, yes, you are. And so he sang the doxology on The Tonight Show. But it was such an interesting voice that um, I really concentrated on making it sound like oral. And when we went to we, – we needed a forward. You always need a forward for these books from somebody who knows them and, and is famous and, you know, for the same thing. And we finally settled on the fact that oral should write his own forward. Well, of course, I wrote that too. And so I wrote, you know, we looked for somebody and, and I think, you know, I, I should do this. And, and so um, the book comes out and it became my first New York Times bestseller because I really had caught his voice. Mm -hmm. And people even said to him, you know, the way you wrote that forward, you should have written that book. Well, <laughs> he had to tell him, well, Jerry wrote that too. But uh, that really turned the corner for me as far as uh, how to do these, to really get out of the way. And I'm trying to write it from their standpoint as if they knew how to write, not as if I were the, the athlete. And uh, what, what really makes it come home, I think, is that they're, when they really sound like them, it subliminates the author, which is what you want. I don't want to be, I mean, it's nice enough to have my name on there and to cash a royalty check, but it has to be their book. And I always tell them, you have full veto power over every word, because if I use lingo or one of my pet phrases and it doesn't sound like you, it won't ring true. So that, uh, that helps a lot. As far as life lessons, because so many of these were athletes, um, I, I learned what it takes for a guy to be at a different level. I, I worked with Joe Gibbs, the former football coach who owns a NASCAR team, Mike Singletary, who was another Chicago Bear, uh, guys like that. And all these guys, the, the bottom line with professional athletes, especially Hall of Famers, and almost everybody I've written about became a Hall of Famer. I take the credit for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you should. You should. <laughs> I, I should. But they, uh, they are so competitive. They compete at everything. They, they compete to see who can be most courteous or open the door, or, you know, that type of thing. And uh, I even said to, to Oral Horshazer one time, because he was such a great all-around athlete, I said, um, you know, you're more than just a baseball star. You, you do all these other things. I said, in fact, the only thing I could probably even hope to compete with you at would be table tennis, because I'd played some tournament table tennis. And I saw this glint in his eye in about a half oh, hour. No. 
<laughs> yeah. no. About a half hour later, he gets back to it and he says, we got to play some table tennis man, because I, uh, you know, he just had to compete at everything. And they are obsessive about detail, mm -hmm. uh, preparation, uh, thought, thinking things through. And, and I tried to apply as much as that as, of that as I could. And of course, all the time I'm writing these books, I'm raising three sons. And so I'm trying to teach them to what sets these guys apart is this attention to detail, this obsession with preparation and with doing things right. Uh, even if they're losing nine to one in the last inning, they're going to lose the game. Every pitch, every at bat, everything, they do the best they can because for one thing, it honors their opponent. Mm. And it's just the way to do it. You don't ever slack off. And I think that has informed my career and really has, has been a large reason for, for my success is kind of following what they, they taught me there. Well, uh, I can brag on you a little bit because I've taken some of your courses and I've met you in person and you do epitomize that, Jerry, you really do because your, your guild is, is run really well. You make sure you talk to everybody, you're personable, uh, you're very professional, but you're approachable and that's what, I, that's what I love about you and that's why I wanted you to come on because you, you are the writer's writer, that's the way I look at it, because you know what it's like to be where I am, where I only have a compilation book out, and I'm trying to get other books out, and people who are watching are trying to get published. You've been there, and you don't forget that. And you want to bring people like us up with you. Yeah, I do appreciate I do appreciate that, and I, um, and I do care about beginning writers and, and developing writers, because because uh, I do remember that it's, it can be a lonely time and the competition is great and it's getting more all the time. But uh, there's a, a real fulfillment that comes with paying it forward. I've had, been blessed and I've had a wonderful career and uh, I want people to avoid the same mistakes I did. They can shave years off their learning curve this way. And uh, so it's just fun to, to share what I know and see people come along. Well, I want to thank you for that. And I have a question for you. When you're writing a biography, how much time do you spend with the person? Is it on the phone? Is it face to face? Are you watching them in video? Or is it all the above? It is all the above. Uh, <laughs> crucial thing is uh, the face to face time, because then you really get to see them in their element, see them at home, see how they react with their family. Um, and that usually takes somewhere you know, it's several days, and sometimes I, I break it down into hours, but it's, you know, spending enough time with a person to, to really get to, to catch their voice and understand what they're about. Um, and one of the things that I always did, too, is I had a policy. These guys were all so famous, and people always had their hands out when they met them. Mm -hmm. They wanted an autograph or a picture, yeah. or they wanted a, them to call their wife or, you know, say, say something to her on the phone or happy birthday, whatever. People always wanted things from them. Well, I would go start with a publisher and say, if I can get this person and do their book, what would the offer be? How much money can we give them and, and all that? And what I was paying for, what the publisher was paying for, was their time to spend with me. And then, of course, we'd split the royalties and all that. But I always took this tack that that, that had been paid for. The fact that I was going to be there and spend some time with them, they were going to have to carve that out. And it's hard to do for guys that are that busy. Mm. But I didn't ask them for anything else. Even though I had young boys at home, I wasn't asking for penance and pictures and free tickets and stuff like that. And almost to a guy, every time they would notice that I wasn't asking them for anything. Mm. And they would eventually say, would you like uh, you know, a signed picture for your kids or you know, whatever? Well, sure. And I'd be, be thrilled to do it. That helped break the ice. It helped sort of bond us. Um, but it, the, the question about how much time is really, it's how much time you need. Some guys I could, I could do it with 10 hours of FaceTime and then I could look in their files. I could talk to the PR department. I could watch videos, you know, all, all that stuff. Uh, with some of them like Nolan Ryan who pitched for over 20 years and was, you know, super famous. There were file cabinets worth of stuff in, in their offices that I would have access to. So I wouldn't ask him about stuff I already knew. I would ask him, what it was mm -hmm. like when that happened. How did you feel when you pitched a sixth no hitter and you were in your forties? And mm -hmm. you know, instead of saying, tell me about that no hitter, I would say, you know, I know all, all about the no hitter. I know every at bat. I've seen it on video. I, you know, so tell me where, where you were at that point, what you were thinking. So that really, I think adds to the, to the stories. When you do a biography, um, do you do their whole life or do you do a certain aspect of their life? How does that work? Most of mine have been life stories, and that's tricky for sports things because 
a lot of guys, I mean, they're, they're very Samish. They, they um, would have been the best athlete in their elementary school and little league and, and on up and they were stars. And, and so it's just a story of how they were recognized and, and the odds against it are always great. So what was the turmoil? How did you make it against all odds? Um, but it's an interesting question because in, in a memoir, you know, the difference between a memoir and a, and a biography is a memoir will take a theme and it might mm -hmm. be 12 anecdotes from the person's life, not necessarily in order, but uh, they would support that theme, how I came from nothing to this or how I overcame drugs or abuse or whatever. Um, and, and that's the important thing. That's the mistake a lot of people make with memoirs is they include too much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with a biography too, I think that can be a mistake too. I don't want to say, you know, I was born on this day and, I, and bring you all the way up to the present yeah. where you're pitching in the World Series. I might want to start with that World Series and then flash back a little bit or, or do some backstory. But that brings up an important point about how you research. When I interview somebody, I always do it on, uh, I always record it so that it's, um, you know, I've got every word and people are doing like I do. I repeat myself and I ramble and this and that, and it doesn't always hold together when I'm speaking. So when I get, get that transcript made, I might have several hundred pages of manuscript. And the biggest part of the job is not the writing, it's the organizing of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I'll take a, a ruler and scissors and I go through and I'll cut out strips and I put all that stuff, all that entire interview, back in order chronologically, as if I were going to write from birth to death. I'll have different folders for different years. And because a guy will be talking and he'll say something about a, a Little League game when he was 12. And then he'll say, you know, because I started actually playing catch with my dad when I was four and when I was in kindergarten, this or that happened. So they're jumping around time-wise. I'm putting that back together chronologically, not because I'm going to write it chronologically, just so I get that full sweep and, and know. And so then when I write, as I say, I may start with today. I may start with the, the most dramatic point in their career and then jump back to these other things. But that can take uh, a week of eight-hour days. Just mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll, I'll do it on the floor or on a king-size bed because you've got stuff all over the place. It's bigger than any desk. But... Uh, that, when, I, when I talk to other people that do biographies, they say that uh, they didn't realize at first that it was going to take that kind of work, but that's the key to make the, make the writing happen. Thank you. And thank you for clarifying the difference between a biography and a memoir, because I still didn't, I was still hazy in that area. So now I know a memoir has a theme. <laughs> I like that. Now, do you recommend any books in the genre, uh, how to write in the genre biographies? Are there any how-to books or I know... One thing I love about you, you say, read, 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 read. Yeah. So, can you expound on that? Yeah, I should have had a list of the ones that are, uh, you know, the, the titles, and I don't. But if, if you Google Writer's Digest books and talk about uh, Google memoir writing or biography or even autobiography, they've got some good ones. Uh, I always, as you know, uh, if you listen to my teaching, as I always espouse that you learn an awful lot of writing by osmosis. So, um, read a lot of biography. If you're going to write somebody's biography or if you're going to write your own or a memoir, I would read 50 of those um, to just get a feel for the genre and what works. And you'll also see what doesn't work. You'll see some people that'll always want to write chronologically and it gets boring after a while. You say, I want to get to the good part. Well, now they're taking you through high school and college. And, and uh, maybe you just want to say one thing about elementary school and then college where you met your spouse or whatever, tell that story. Um, just like any other kind of writing, especially just like fiction, every word should count. So uh, that's, that's the trickiest part, I think, of writing a biography, is that people feel they need to cover the entire waterfront. And uh, if your eyes glaze over writing it, your reader's going to be asleep. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. Now, what is the difference between writing a biography and a fiction or a nonfiction book? Is, what are the differences that you find? Well, I remember when I first started writing fiction, I thought this is going to be fun because with a biography, uh, a person comes to a, a fork in the road and they decide to go this way. And I'm thinking, I have to tell it that way because this is a true story. I would have gone that way or wonder mm -hmm. what would have happened. And so I thought, well, in fiction, I'll just create that. I'll make that up and, and uh, my characters will do what I want them to do. And I find that fictional characters aren't any more cooperative than nonfiction characters. They do what they want. They say what they want. And I, and I follow them. And, and uh, that's what makes us authors is trusting your gut and saying, you know, I, I need to need to follow this and see where it goes. 
Um, the biggest difference is you are limited to the truth, obviously, with, with uh, uh, nonfiction. With a novel, ironically, the, the, the definitions of fiction and nonfiction almost seem to have flip-flopped because nonfiction today has to be unbelievable. It's about people dying, going to heaven, coming back, telling stories, you know, and you don't know if it's really true, but they're saying it's true, so at least this is their story. Mm-hmm. But in fiction, fiction has to be believable. So mm-hmm. here, you, you know, we've got this genre, it's a novel, and you say, well, but fantasy doesn't have to be believable or, or futuristic. Actually, it does. When you, when you watch Star Wars or Star Trek or one of these futuristic things, the premise has to make sense for you to buy the, you know, the rest of the story. So fiction has to be believable. Nonfiction has to be spectacular, unbelievable. Um, but there are things that cross over. I mean, I think the best biographies are the ones that do include tension and conflict and, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, building to climax and, and uh, uh, setups and payoffs. And uh, especially the dialogue, conversation, mm. uh, people realize that it's, it's not going to be exact. You weren't there for every conversation, but they allow you that freedom because this is probably what it would have sounded like. And you need that in there. People write biography that's simply narrative summary. Um, I don't think readers will stay with it. No. And I want to ask you, because I, I listen to Valley of Dry Bones. I like audiobooks better than um, reading sometimes, especially at night because my eyes are so tired from being on the computer all day. But in any of your characters, not necessarily Valley of Dry Bones, but there's a lot of great characters in there. Have you drawn from the people that you have interviewed, some of their characteristics and put them in your characters? Uh, I'm careful about that because I, I, I wouldn't want it to, to show. I mean, if, it, mm. you know, if somebody had, had the same experience as one of my biographical characters, um, but those do inform me. Um, I might use a character quality. Yeah. I might use a, 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 a turn of phrase that they use or the way they express themselves or how they look when they're speaking, that type of thing. Uh, interesting, my late mother was once, at, once asked if she saw me in any of my characters. And she said, I see him in every character. And I thought, that's really insightful. That's not just a proud mom. I am in every character because when mm-hmm. I, if I'm writing about a young boy or even a young girl or an old woman, I have to be that person at that time and say, all right, if this was me, how would I react? What would I think? What would I say? And, and somehow mom saw me in there and, uh, and, and said that. I thought that was interesting. That's got to love our moms. That's wonderful. Well, before we wrap it up, I want to ask you a few more questions, but what do you read for fun? Do you have time to read just for fun? I do. And uh, I'm one of those. It's, it always surprises people. I have come to start preferring books on online. Um, people said, you know, for a while, I thought that was going to supersede real books because they're so handy. Whenever I used to go on vacation, I would have to take a briefcase full of books and now I've got them on my phone. My phone's getting really heavy. I've got about 200 books on, on my <laughs> I do phone. too. I have, I don't know, 50 books on Kindle. Yeah, and what happens is you wind up reading more than one book at once. I, mm-hmm. I will, you know, and I always read um, in bed at night before I go to sleep. Uh, I, I, I do a smart thing though. There's a thing on your phone if, if people find it, and it's, uh, I don't, I'm going to forget the term now, but it, it turns your screen uh, milder so it isn't a glaring in the dark. And it, uh, it allows you to, to fall asleep when you want to. <clears throat> I used to read with that bright light in the darkness. And, and then I wondered why I couldn't <laughs> fall asleep. It was wired. But there's a way to do that. Look for that on your phone. But um, I will read maybe um, a couple chapters of, of a biography. Right now I'm reading a, a memoir of Les Edgerton, who's a, uh, uh, a great novelist and also teaches writing. And I'm going to have him on a master class. But oh, he, great. his first book was, he says, about 85% autobiographical, but it's a novel. And so it's fun. And, and his writing was limited back then because it was his first book and I see mistakes and things like that, but he's such a good writer now. And uh, so you can see his, his writer arc, but I'll read that. And then I might switch over and read Hooked, which is his book on, on how to grab readers from the, from the get-go. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'll read the Bible, I'll read uh, devotional books, um, and then just maybe a, a straight novel from, from somebody else. Um, that's the difference between the way I used to read because I didn't have a bunch of books open all over the place, but now I'm, I'm usually reading four or five things at a time. And, uh, if one just grabs me, I'll just read only that till I'm done. But, uh, 
um, yeah, I read, I'm, I'm reading several books a month, every month. Wonderful. We have 10 minutes. I wanted to say to you one profound thing that you said to me and Cecil Murphy and Liz Curtis Higgs and some other best selling writers is you all keep learning. And you just said that you're, you're learning from other writers. And I think that's wonderful. And you're also teaching. And I want you to tell us about what your course is. Jerry's Guild has helped me, but you have a novel writing course. Um, in about two minutes, can you tell us what's going on and how people can get a hold of you, Jerry? Yeah, the, the best way to, to get a hold of me or see what I'm up to is just jerryjenkins.com. Um, I have my free blog and, and lots of features for writers or people who want to be writers. That's what I blog about is, is writing and writing technique. But I also have uh, the Jerry Jenkins Writers Guild, and you can get to that through jerryjenkins.com. But that is a, a paid monthly thing, and uh, we have several features, and I'm always working at, I want to keep those people with me because, um, you know, you don't want people to drop off, and I want to make it fresh, and I always want to give them a bargain. So we have master classes. That's where I'll bring in uh, an expert publisher or writer or agent, um, and we just talk about what's happening in the industry and and. We, we don't promote their books. And a lot of times people, you know, you get on and they talk about what they're writing. And so here's where you can get it. I always tell people where they can get their, their books and I give them their website. But the important thing is, what can we teach the writers? This mm -hmm. is what the is for. And then I do a thing called the live online uh, workshop. And that's where I'm teaching on a different aspect of writing. I'll teach for about an hour on dialogue, conflict, tension, uh, structure, contracts, anything, you know, we want to talk about, and then have a uh, half hour of live Q&A. And that's always a rich time. People ask great questions. Um, and then I have what's called office hours. You mentioned that, and that's where uh, all the members can simply uh, check in at the same time, ask any question they want. And if their question doesn't get answered, we keep track of those. They put them on, on the forum, and I'll answer it for sure within the next week. Um, and then one of the most popular features that I offer, and it never ceases to amaze me, I've done this all over the world and people always say it, um, it it's called Manuscript Repair and Rewrite. And I just take the first page of somebody's um, novel or nonfiction and I just do, I edit it the way it would need to be edited to be what I consider saleable, um, uh, publishable. And so often, I mean, and I'm really tearing these up. I mean, every other word seems to be crossed out or put somewhere else. And I've experienced probably about seven of those and they just, they've helped me become a better writer. Yeah. People say that. And I think the reason is that so often, you know, when, especially when you're starting out, you know, three quarters of the stuff you send out, you get back with a polite no. And they say it doesn't meet a current need. Uh, obviously that means they don't like it or the writing isn't right. And so writers are saying, why won't they tell me what I did wrong so I can fix it? Well, that's not their job. Their job is right. to find publishable stuff. And I say, but that is my job. You're paying me to be your writing coach, your virtual mentor. So, uh, so I'm going to do it. And I'm not mean. I, I don't, uh, you know, put people no, down. No. But I say, I'm, I'm not going to hold back either because you want to learn. And, and most people are fi finally get to the point where they, they get past this thing of I just want to be discovered because I know I'm great. My mother loves my stuff, my aunt, my uncles, you know, and, and yet nothing sells. And I go, yeah, but look what you've done here and look what you've done here and how, mm. and how you can fix it. And they go, voila, I can do this. Yes. I can learn to do this myself. I didn't. And, and why don't we see it in our own writing? I don't know why. But that first guy I told you about that I wrote the book with, with uh, Hank Aaron, he was such a good editor. My goal became to give him something. He would second edit whatever I edited and he would edit whatever I wrote. And every time it was the way you see on manuscript repair and rewrite. I, I'm surprised my head doesn't have a dent in it from me going, why didn't I see that? <laughs> I, my goal became to give him something he wouldn't have to fix. Now, I never got there, but I got better. And that's what made me the writer and editor I am today because uh, I started to see subtle redundancies and, mm. and repetition and just, just obvious mistakes. They're obvious to me now. They may not have been then, but that's, I think, what people like about the manuscript repair and rewrite sessions. So, jerryjenkins.com. Right. I just want to thank you, Jerry, so much for being here. It's, it's been a help for me and I know for those who will be watching. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on.